As 1943 dawned, the vast fields of Kursk bore witness to a desperate effort by the German forces to regain dominance on the Eastern Front. It was here that the Hummel self-propelled artillery, with its foreboding silhouette, emerged. Armed with a thunderous 15cm SFH-18-1 howitzer, this behemoth of German engineering was envisioned as the ultimate mobile artillery asset for the Blitzkrieg tactics. The Hummel symbolized more than German armored might. It represented a critical bid to overturn the growing resilience and counteroffensives of the Soviet army. Its sleek yet robust design, perched atop a Panzer IV chassis, allowed the Hummel, a bumblebee, to traverse the rough terrain with unstoppable determination. A high-velocity howitzer, nestled within an open-top compartment, delivered devastating blows to enemy fortifications and tanks alike. Self-propelled artillery refers to artillery guns or howitzers mounted on a motorized chassis, creating a mobile and self-contained artillery system. Unlike towed artillery, which requires a separate vehicle to transport and position the artillery piece, self-propelled artillery has its own means of mobility. This provides several advantages, including faster deployment, increased maneuverability on the battlefield, and the ability to relocate swiftly after firing. Typically, self-propelled artillery vehicles are equipped with tracks or wheels, allowing them to traverse various terrains. They often feature a fully enclosed armored structure to protect the crew from hostile fire. The mobility of self-propelled artillery makes it a versatile component of every military force, especially those on the offensive, as was the case of the Wehrmacht during the early years of World War II. Germany had conquered Western Europe and had launched the world's largest and most ambitious military operation of all time during the summer of 1941, Operation Barbarossa, the subjugation of the vast Soviet Union. As the operation progressed and the Third Reich marched victoriously over Russian-controlled territories, German commanders realized they faced a numerically superior enemy that had armored vehicles by the thousands. The Reich had powerful panzers, but sheer firepower was not enough to confront the waves of tanks and support vehicles the Soviet Union rushed to the battlefield. They required artillery cooperation that could quickly respond to the ever-changing battlefield conditions to provide direct fire support to ground troops when necessary to keep the communist enemy at bay. The Reich unleashed its artillery, aptly dubbed the King of the Battlefield, to devastating effect. Working in unison with the fearsome German panzers, these powerful guns hammered enemy vehicle formations into submission, silenced opposing artillery with precise counter-battery fire, and relentlessly pounded enemy strongholds. Their thunderous barrages provided critical support to infantry and armored units, paving the way for offensive surges and turning the tide in numerous confrontations. Germany's war fronts had expanded, and there was a growing need to supply the Heer and the Waffen-SS with self-propelled artillery guns that could keep up with the speed of Panzer divisions. Toad artillery was slow, and the German armies could not wait for them to catch up. At the same time, their front lines were being overwhelmed by Allied troops, especially on the Eastern Front. Following the concept that the best defense is a good offense, the Wehrmacht requested the introduction of an armored vehicle carrying an artillery gun to assist during offensive operations. In early 1942, the Army was authorized with the project and issued requirements for such vehicles. At the time, the German Army had two primary variants of self-propelled guns, each with a distinct purpose. One wielded an anti-tank weapon, while the others sported an artillery howitzer. The Geschützwagen, or gun vehicle, bore the nomenclature SF, symbolizing Selbstfahrlefett, or self-propelled carriage. The Panzerfeldhaubitze, or armored field howitzer, aptly described its artillery prowess. These self-propelled guns emerged as the answer to a strategic imperative, delivering agile artillery support that paced the relentless advance of Panzer divisions. Operating in both direct and indirect fire modes, they were envisioned to unleash devastation on visible targets or rain indirect fire on coordinates meticulously plotted on maps. These mobile artillery vehicles were not designed for frontline tank duels. Instead, they were the mechanized master of artillery, orchestrating high explosive barrages over the heads of friendly forces. Often firing blind, their shells reaching distant enemy targets required coordination with forward observers who relayed adjustments turning these self-propelled guns into instrumental pieces in destroying foreign enemy forces. The German army began experimenting with the chassis of the reliable Panzer III tanks with 15cm FH-18-1 or heavy Feldhaubitze howitzers in 1942. Also dubbed the Immerkun or Evergreen, this powerful artillery piece was the standard division-level howitzer of the German army. 
Tests were also conducted with the chassis of Panzer IV tanks, which led the army to opt for a vehicle that employed the best of both tanks. As such, the new self-propelled vehicle comprised the drive and steering of the Panzer III and the suspension and engine of the Panzer IV. A brand new superstructure and mounting hardware were added to the vehicle to mount the powerful evergreen artillery piece. The result was the creation of the Special Purpose Vehicle 165, nicknamed the Hummel or Bumblebee. The innovative open-top back design of this self-propelled ordnance piece, although leaving the six-man crew outgunned and exposed, harbored distinct advantages. The raised commander's position within the crew cube, shielded by defensive armored guards, afforded a commanding view on all sides. If enemy small arms fire erupted in the vicinity, the crew could utilize a binary lens rangefinder telescope extending over the armored casement. This not only ensured strategic visibility, but also shielded the crew from small arms and shell shrapnel during transport to the battlefield. In the mobility department, the Hummel proved a leap forward regarding artillery transportation, for it could seamlessly traverse diverse terrains, shadowing the army wherever it ventured. Notably, the gun boasted rapid readiness, swiftly transitioning from transport to combat, outpacing conventional ordnance. Horsepower persisted alongside tracked vehicles of the German army. Each field gun formed a six-steed platoon, with the gun and limber drawn by these horse pairs. Essential supplies resided in the limber, a substantial box atop a pair of buses, accompanied by seats. Three men oversaw each pair of horses, while the remaining six of the gun crew perched atop the limber. Although three-ton half-tracks hauled a relative few, the majority relied on the rhythmic cadence of horse-drawn power. As mentioned before, the main armament of the Hummel comprised the popular and reliable 15cm Evergreen Howitzer. Over 6,700 artillery pieces of this variant would be developed between 1934 and 1945, and with good reason, it had excellent mobility, range, and firepower. The Evergreen weighed over 5,500 kilograms, or 12,000 pounds, had a total length of 7.8 meters, a width of 2.22 meters, and a height of almost 2 meters. The crew of seven could accurately fire over four rounds a minute without issues. Each high-explosive shell weighed 44 kilograms, or 95 pounds, and was fired at speeds of over 520 meters per second at a range of 13,000 meters, or 20,000 yards, with devastating firepower. The high-explosive shell was loaded in two parts as a separate loading round. The projectile was first put into the gun breech and was followed by a separate canister from behind. In addition to the lethal explosive rounds, the Evergreen could fire AP, or armor-piercing rounds, at close ranges to wreak havoc among enemy armor. The crew could fire smoke shells for tactical operations to conceal troop movements, cover retreats, or simply puzzle the enemy. The Hummel entered the fray of World War II in February 1943, under the firms Rheinmetall and Alcat. The final design, with howitzer and platform included, had a weight of 24 tons, a length of 7 meters, a width of 3 meters, and a height of 2.81 meters. In addition to the standard Evergreen gun and 20 rounds, the crew had access to a single 7.92mm MG34 machine gun with over 600 rounds. The Maybach HL120 TRM V12 petrol engine allowed the Hummel to reach a top speed of around 42 kilometers or 26 miles per hour, with an operational range of 215 kilometers. If the crew was going to participate in long-range operations, they could be accompanied by a particular ammunition carrier to transport additional rounds and supplies. These carriers were Hummels that lacked the howitzer cannon, but featured the same Panzer chassis to catch up. Early versions of the Hummel were fitted with a wire mesh top screen to prevent enemy grenades and mines from being thrown into the crew compartment. Although the open design had benefits, the crew suffered greatly during the harsh winters of the Eastern Front. Still, the men made do, and always provided the necessary artillery support. The Hummel's first combat operation began during Operation Citadel, the Battle of Kursk, in July 1943. As part of the most extensive armored encounter of World War II, the first Hummels were integrated into the Army and Waffen-SS as part of their artillery regiment battalions. During the hellish artillery barrages and the intense movement of entire tank formations from both sides, the Hummels that entered service were crucial for pushing back Soviet armor that engaged the German panzers. Nevertheless, despite the effectiveness of the powerful Hummels, it was not enough to push back the Soviets and their numerically superior numbers. As the war escalated and Germany was slowly surrounded, the Hummels kept engaging Allied troops at the western and eastern fronts until Germany's surrender. In 